Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, uh, dear friends and colleagues. As the announcement said, my name is Bobo Lowe, and I have the great pleasure and honor to moderate a discussion on the state of global order and the changing dynamics of international power. To discuss this critically important subject, we have, I think, a great panel. Um, I'll introduce them one by one. Uh, first, uh, uh, Teresa Fallon, Director of the Center for Russia, Europe, and Asia Studies in Brussels. <laughs> Our next panelist is Paul Bolt, Professor of Political Science at the US Air Force Academy and co-author of a recent book entitled China, Russia, and 21st Century Global Geopolitics. Welcome, Paul. Thank you. Um, our third speaker is uh, Pina Akpina from the Istanbul Policy Center. Uh, she is a frequent commentator on Turkish domestic and foreign policy and also Middle Eastern affairs. Welcome, Pina. And finally, we have Vadim Chernish, Ukraine's Minister of Temporarily Occupied Territories and Internally Displaced Persons. Welcome, Minister. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, we are truly living through a period of extraordinary global transformation in which the very nature of world order is in question. The liberal rules-based international order faces, I think, its greatest challenges since the end of the Cold War. And yet, at the same time, there is little evidence of a so-called post-American, post-liberal, post-Western world order to take its place. Instead, we find ourselves, I think, confronting an enormous void, a strategic, a political, a normative void. We don't ladies and gentlemen, I put to you, have a new world order. Rather, we have a new world disorder. The erosion of a functioning rules-based international system of any kind, democratic or other. We find that global norms are breaking down and a cynical, deeply selfish rail politic has taken its place. Great power competition, as Damon Wilson noted, is on the rise. We, I think, face a crisis of leadership across the globe that is as great as at any time since the 1930s. I think for many countries, power and the right to exercise it without restriction has become the paramount virtue. Moral relativism is king and truth what passes for truth, has become almost entirely subjective, giving way to so-called narratives. And in the meantime, we seem to be hopelessly unready to confront the great challenges of our time, whether it is in combating climate change, managing international security, preserving global free trade, or harnessing the technological and information revolutions to the larger good. So against this I think extremely disturbing backdrop, I want to begin our discussion by putting three sets of questions to our panelists, but also to you in the audience. The first question is this. Is the rules-based international order dead in the water, or can it be revived? And if it can be revived, on what basis? How will we actually go about doing it? My second question to you all is this. We talk a lot about the threat that China or Russia or various authoritarian powers pose to the liberal world order, to the rules-based international system. Yet what is exactly the nature of these challenges? Do they, in fact, represent the main threat to liberal institutions, norms, and values, or are we just using them as, a con as convenient scapegoats to hide our own failings, the dysfunctionality of what passes for the rules-based international order today. And finally, 
How should Western countries and institutions respond to the threat, to the challenges of authoritarian regimes in China, in Russia, and elsewhere? We talk about a shift uh, away from uh, the policy of engagement with China to something much more competitive, much more confrontational. But has the policy of engagement, not just with China, but with Russia, with other authoritarian regimes, has that policy of engagement run its course? And if so, then what are the alternatives to engagement? Anyway, so I want to start our uh, discussion with a question to you, Theresa. Really, is the US-led liberal world order over? Is Donald Trump just a a temporary aberration? Are we taking him too seriously? And you know, we're constantly told, you know, forget about the tweets, look at what he's actually doing. So is the liberal world order alive and kicking and we're just really exaggerating its decline or demise? Okay. Thank you very much. I see we're in the post-lunch coma period. So first of all, I want to thank the organizers for this invitation. I've never been in such a beautiful place for a conference. So I really want to thank everyone for the hospitality. It's outstanding. It's just such a gorgeous place here. So I'm going to try this dobre dia. Yeah? So oh, sorry, can you hear me? Okay. Um, so for seven decades, the world has been dominated by Western liberal order as we know it. After the Second World War, the United States and its partners built a multifaceted and sprawling international order organized around economic openness, multilateral institutions, security cooperation, and democratic solidarity. But as Bobo Lo pointed out, these are not happy times for the global liberal order. Um, no one can be sure how deep this crisis is, has gone. And as the title of this panel, Three Shades of Red, Russia, China, and Turkey, Changing Global Power Dynamics, we're seeing power constellations that are shifting and new alliances that are being created, often thought unimaginable in the past. And as you asked about Trump, Trump it is, Trumpism is actively hostile to the liberal internationalism. So what does this mean for the future? Um, the US is still a democracy and things can change with the next election, but we also must remember that the liberal international order um, has been around for quite a long time and it, it, it's resilient and it can respond to this. Um, but as Thomas Hobbes said and warned us, hell is truth seen too late. The course of change is so dramatically fast and the technological revolution forces us to take actions. We can't just admire the problem, we, we've diagnosed it, but we really have to come up with a prescription for what's going on. Freedom House uh, released a report which finds that democracy and freedom around the world has declined for the 13th year in a row. So that's a very negative story right there. But right now we think about 1989 and the fall of the Berlin Wall, it's 30 years ago. But at the same time, 30 years ago, we saw what happened in Tiananmen Square. So we're coming up to the fourth, June 4th anniversary. So this was a time when people were celebrating in Europe, but in China, a few months later, it was very, in, on June 4th, it was a very terrible story. The history of China changed dramatically. And now we're, we're having to confront this um, country now. So this is what we call Black Weekend. And the Chinese students, what did they want? They wanted greater freedom and an end to corruption. So we've seen China take a very different course. Um, we all knew China was rising, but none of us foresaw the political dysfunction. So everything lately is China, China, China. And China is not really a model. I see, hear all these people talk about how great it is. You can pay for things with your phone. Um, you have a social credit score. But I don't see a lot of people wanting to get up and move to China and live there for the long term. Maybe they want to go to make money for the short term. But it's not a model I think many countries want to emulate. Um, and neither is, a, is Russia really a model that many other countries want to emulate. Um, these are authoritarian capitalist states. But this type of state does not translate into a broad set of alternative ideas for the organization of world order. They're kind of poking and seeing where it's weak and you know, just finding out where it's weak and kind of turning the screw there. Um, the values, interests, and mutual vulnerabilities that drove the rise and spread of the current order are still with us. Crises and transformation and liberal internationals have marked its 200 year passage to the present. So if you look at John Eikenberry, he talks about li liberal internationalism for 200 years. So it has evolved and it has to respond to crises. We see many books on the shelf now, John Mearsheimer, Stephen Waltz, the realist approach. Um, but it's not so attractive, is it? It doesn't really motivate young people. Um, if liberal democracy survives this era too, will liberal internationalism. 
So complacency kills, I talked about we admire the problem, but we really have to come up with some solutions. So I, I suggest we need resilience. The global order will need to be rethought and reinvented. It needs to respond to technological change, shifting demographics and modernity. We need a rejuvenated global order. Um, so Teresa, what are you offering? So you say that we need to be more responsive, we need to be resilient, but what exactly are we fighting for here? What is the liberal world order? Does a rules-based international order even exist? And if it exists, what is it? What's it based on? Well, the rules-based international order, for example, 93% um, of world trade is by sea. And the United Nations Convention of the Law of the Sea, UNCLOS, is something most EU member states, the EU itself has signed up for. But if this is um, being reinterpreted by major powers like China, they, they signed up for it, they were there at the drafting in 1983, yeah. and they're actually reinterpreting this. So this is causing a problem in the international order. So also we see the WTO, Donald Trump, President Donald Trump does not want to uh, yeah. have mm -hmm. judges. So we're seeing kind of the, the basics of the whole system tending to unravel. But I think Europe needs to be a little more uh, alive and, and they're working hard now to come up with some sort of alternative to the WTO um, reforms that are necessary. Because when China signed up for the WTO uh, back in 2001, it had promised to make all these reforms and opening up, but it's 2019 and they haven't complied. So what happens when uh, the idea of having a country like China use the system to enrich itself but not follow the rules. So they're actually tearing at the, the very delicate fabric of these systems that have been built over time through trial and error, and you have a big player like China pulling at the thread and just kind of unraveling the entire international order. They're not offering so much in return right now. Sure. Now people talk about the Asia Infrastructure Investment Bank, mm -hmm. for example, the AIIB, and European countries just ran to it. They didn't even give the EU time to kind of form a response. But now I was just at a conference in Brussels on Tuesday and a German MEP complained that all these countries that had signed up for it, he used this metaphor of being put on a boat left in the middle of a lake and the Chinese say, no, you have to do what we tell you to do. So yeah. this idea of offering an alternative to say the World Bank or the IMF, the Chinese kind of lured countries into joining and now they're kind of having to follow China's rules, like it or not, they've already sunk yeah. the money into the system. So to quote, uh, John Eikenberry, to bet on the future of the global liberal order is a little bit like a second marriage, a triumph of hope <laughs> over experience. That's very interesting. Um, I'll get Paul to talk about uh, China and uh, Russia in the international system, but I, I still wanted to push you a little bit more, if I may, because you mentioned the United States, you mentioned China in relation to the law of the sea. Yet it is the United States that has failed to ratify the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea, and there's no sign of it doing so anytime soon. It has withdrawn from the Paris Climate Change Agreement. It's trashed the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action with Iran. It's withdrawn from the Intermediate Nuclear Forces Treaty. It's renegotiated I think putting Mexico and Canada under duress, it's renegotiated NAFTA, and it's withdrawn from the TPP. So a lot of people looking outside would say, yes, China breaks a lot of rules, but surely the United States is rule breaker in chief. What do you say in response to those who say, rules-based international system? What rules-based? The United States initially made the rules, and now it's trashing those rules. What do you say to those criticisms? I would say I don't work for Donald Trump. Right. <laughs> so it's true that uh, it's under great duress. TPP was not part of the international order. The Obama administration had um, negotiated for six years. Many of the Asian countries that were in the negotiations, for example, Japan, uh, Pr Prime Minister Abe used a lot of political capital to get that passed. And all of these problems that the U.S. is having now with China would have been probably avoided if the U.S. had joined TPP. But at, on day three, you know, Donald Trump, you know, just ended that. So I think his policy approaches wouldn't be what I would have advised him to do, right. and I think it's very troublesome. I know many people uh, in U.S. Navy, other organizations that would love for the U.S. to be part of UNCLOS, uh, the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea. It will just not get through Congress. That's not good enough, but the reality is that the U.S. follows 
United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea. And the People's Republic of China signed it, but they don't follow it. So there's a big difference there. Okay. Paul, I want to switch to you. Uh, Teresa alluded to um, China's challenge to the liberal world order, to world order in general. How do you see the nature and extent of the China challenge, but also the Russia challenge? And since we're talking about the two of them, do you see the Sino-Russian partnership as, in a sense, an alliance in all but name, one that threatens to completely dismantle the existing international system? Well, I want to first of all, my, my Yeah, speak in the mic, yeah. I want to first of all thank the organizers. Um, this is a, a beautiful place and certainly enjoyed being here. And um, I just want to uh, note that any views I express are only uh, my own views, uh, not to be claimed by anybody else. Um, but when we talk about the, um, the Chinese-Russian relationship, they uh, claim that it is a strategic partnership. And that's gone back to 1996. And uh, between 1996 and 2014, that partnership kind of waxed and waned. But after 2014 and um, the annexation of Crimea, that partnership strengthened. Mm -hmm. And um, it's, it's based on uh, s several types of um, categories. Uh, first of all, in the security realm, I think border security is a, a very important part of their relationship. Uh, I think we often forget that in 1969, 1969, um, World War III was a danger with some of the conflict that was going on on the, um, the Soviet-Chinese border at the time. Uh, by 2004, the border had been demarcated and um, demilitarized. Um, another aspect of that relationship would be um, arms sales, most recently the sale of the uh, S-400 and SU-35 from uh, Russia to China. Military exercise are another component of this. Um, starting in the last few years, there have been um, at least annual naval exercises, including exercises in the South China Sea, uh, the Baltic Sea, and in the Mediterranean. Another uh, area which ties them together is energy and energy sales. Um, pipe, oil pipelines have been built connecting Russia and China. Um, Russia needs markets and, um, from its perspective, needs to move away from just a reliance on Europe. Um, China needs to import energy from a wide variety of sources to provide it with energy security. Um, Russia has also opened up um, investments in its own energy sector. So there's a Chinese-Russian venture above the Arctic Circle to produce liquefied natural gas. Um, other areas which I think are probably a little bit more threatening to the order would be in um, non-traditional security issues, particularly um, freedom of the Internet. Um, both China and Russia are asserting a national sovereignty over the Internet, which um, is clearly uh, not in line with the interests of the United States, at least. Um. But it, I wonder whether one can make a distinction between the way... Russia and China approach the, the very idea of an international system. Yeah. Because when we look back at the last three decades or so, it seems to me that China has been the big winner from a US-led global order and Western-led economic globalization. Whereas whether Russia's been a winner or not, Russians see themselves as having been cheated by this international system. They think that they have been, that this has systematically deprived Russia of influence and status. Therefore, in the, China might be the big winner, but Russia, or Russians see themselves as the big loser. So I wondered in that, with that in mind, whether the, the Russians, it seems to me, want to trash the existing international system, whereas maybe the Chinese want to exploit it. They, they want to change it. They want to reform it, but they don't want to actually get rid of it, in part because they have nothing to replace it with. I wonder what you thought about it. I think that's a fair point. And um, in both Russia and China experienced humiliations in the past. Mm -hmm. um, for China, it was a century of humiliation, which is talked about quite often as inspiration for uh, moving forward today. But that was further away. With, with Russia, it was the collapse of the Soviet Union. And so China has benefited greatly from the system. But it still sees, 
elements of the system as unfair to it. Um, so, for instance, um, Xi Jinping, uh, 2014, um, criticized the security architecture in Asia and called for sure. a security system that was provided by Asians for Asians. Um, there have been some, um, in spite of China's rise, some discontent with the amount of profits that it gets from producing things mm -hmm. in China versus what the owners of the brands. Sure. So, trying to move forward in that regard. Um, neither. In my view, does China nor Russia have a um, coherent view of what they want an international yeah. order to look yeah. like? Yeah. And so we're very much in a period of transition now, yeah. and uncertainty. I mean, it's, to me, uh, if we're talking about sort of future visions of global order, I was struck. I, I, I was recently in, in China for, a, for about a month, and I was struck how rarely Russia came out in the conversation about the future of global order. So, of course, Russia came up when they were talking about China-Russia relations, and they said how great the relationship was, and so on and so forth. But when it came to actually organizing the global order, the international system, Russia basically didn't feature. And yet, at the same time, we have Vladimir Putin, whose favorite historical analogy is Yalta 1945. He clearly sees a big three running the world. So instead of Churchill, Stalin, and Roosevelt, it would be uh, Donald Trump, Xi Jinping, and of course, Vladimir Putin. So I just wondered whether you could comment on that, how you see it. Well, that's not a very friendly vision for Europeans. No, it isn't. No, it isn't. Um, In either vision, they're excluded, essentially. Yeah. And I think that's the way that in some ways, uh, at least Russians like to think of their relationship with China as an entente, and, and that's basically what they want. And so, interestingly, the model that they would hold up would be um, kind of a, a glorified uh, security, UN Security Council yep. where the great powers get together in an entente yep. and make decisions. Um, it's interesting in some ways that um, Russia and China both are more supportive of Westphalian world, while this international world order that we've talked about moved toward one that's more focused on individual rights and downplay state sovereignty. And I think that's a big part of the conflict between China and Russia on the one hand and the West on the other hand. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, great. Pino, I wanted to uh, move to you. Sitting in, in the UK, it seems to me that much of the Western focus on Turkey has been on three main issues. President Erdogan's consolidation of power, um, the Kurdish question, of course, and Turkey's attempts to reassert its authority in the Middle East. And I was wondering whether this is actually a fair reflection of Ankara's or Erdogan's priorities, or whether his agenda is actually more ambitious. Is he looking for Turkey to be a norm setter? Uh, how does he see Turkey's role and place in the world? Uh, could we see a revival of um, neo-Ottomanism even? Thank you very much. Um, I would say that that has changed significantly in recent years, um, uh, especially since the failed coup attempt in Turkey in 2016. Before that, before the, is it okay? Um, I would say that has changed significantly since 2016, since, since the failed coup attempt in, Tur in Turkey. Before that, uh, we could say that Turkey had an ambitious uh, foreign policy, but now uh, I would say that it is much weaker because of Turkey's uh, weakened capacity, economic capacity and institutional capacity, because Turkish institutions have been significantly weakened in recent years, since the coup especially. Um, when we look at Erdogan's uh, foreign policy priorities, I would uh, divide them into domestic, regional and international. Uh, domestically, um, I mean, overall, if you look at Erdogan's foreign policy, it differs significantly from Davutoglu's foreign policy, uh, Turkey's former uh, foreign minister and prime minister. Uh, we could say that Davutoglu had a certain vision, whether you agree with it or not. Uh, but when you look at Erdogan's uh, foreign policy, uh, you cannot really see a main course of foreign policy. You can see that uh, uh, it uh, caters, I mean, he kind of designs it according to his domestic interests. Uh, he uses it for domestic interests, uh, uses external threats, 
uh, you know, to, to uh, pursue his domestic interests and also uh, uses it to bring in uh, success stories from abroad, especially by using um, tools such as Turkey's aid uh, or mediation uh, or recently Turkey has started to establish military bases abroad, like forward bases in the country. So these are kind of used to bring in success stories from outside. Regionally, um, sustaining uh, his influence in the region is important for Erdogan. Uh, maybe not expanded because of lack of capacity, but... What is the region, just to, to define it for us? The region? Yeah, what counts as uh, the region for Turkey? I would say the Middle East, like the MENA region, and also in recent years, uh, the East Africa, right. and the Gulf, the Persian Gulf region. Right. So I, I would say that these are uh, Turkey's uh, main concerns. Like, uh, Turkey has extended its foreign policy to Asia and Latin America also mm -hmm. uh, in the last 10 years. But its main concern is the broader Middle East region, I would say. Okay. Uh, and regionally, Turkey uses, uh, like, as tools of foreign policy, it uses alliances. And recently, if you look at Turkey's foreign policy, you would say, see that, uh, especially since the Arab Spring, uses more bilateral alliances rather than the broader institutional alliances like you know, the NATO or the traditional uh, alliances. So it has these new alliances, uh, uses aid as yeah. another tool, tool of foreign policy. Uh, the military bases I mentioned, trade, uh, and other soft power tools such as scholarships, like in terms of education and stuff. Um, and internationally, uh, Erdogan pursues a leadership role in the Islamic world, right. uh, which again focuses more on the Middle East, I would say. Um, I mean, Turkey is still not very influential on the, the uh, Muslim communities in Asia, for example, yeah. in Malaysia or Indonesia or uh, India, which have uh, you know, a huge number of Muslims. So it is still like more regional. Is it making um, any kind of co uh, comeback in Central Asia? Uh, well, Central Asia, um, after the Cold War, Turkey pursued uh, certain policies in Central Asia. You know, it's, for example, Turkey's official development agency, uh, TICA, which is very active now, uh, you know, and it is a very important institution in Turkey's foreign sure. policy, I would say. It was established after the Cold War uh, specifically to, um, to uh, you know, uh, improve Turkey's relations with post-Soviet countries. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But um, as much as Turkey tried to exert influence in those, uh, you know, in those lands, in those geographies, Russia was a huge rival. Sure. And again, Turkey lacked the capacity. So there is always this ambition and this desire to, you know, to expand uh, the power and influence, but uh, there are always the obstacles, mm -hmm. uh, like Russia or other uh, powers that, uh, you know, kind of prevent Turkey from expanding the influence. And my fi final point in terms of Tur Erdogan's uh, foreign policy priorities comes to your first question, the question you asked at the, at the beginning of the panel to all of us. Uh, it's about the international system and the, the rule-based international order, uh, Erdogan uh, has been uh, basically trying to reform the international system. It's okay. one of his priorities. Uh, and the UN, uh, hence his motto, the world is bigger than five. <laughs> so if he often in international platforms criticizes the fact that the international order is dominated by these five uh, actors, the UN Security Council actors, and um, criticizes the international order and looks for kind of avenues to, uh, like, you know, to be able to maneuver uh, within the international system uh, to, uh, to kind of exert his interests and Turkey's interest in the international system. So often uh, in the international platforms, uh, like he defends the, the rights of the oppressed, for example, yeah. Yeah. Uh, the Muslim communities around the world, like Palestine, always uses Palestine mm -hmm. in his discourse, or the Muslim communities uh, in Asia, the oppressed communities in Asia and stuff. Uh, so you can see that there is this criticism uh, in his discourse that the rule-based international order is no longer no longer caters to uh, the interests of the um, the, the people, you know. Uh, I mean, that's, that's all very interesting. 
let me paint a scenario for you. Let us say, for the sake of argument, that Erdogan gets over this economic hump that, that's, preventing, that, that's constraining Turkey, that he uh, reconsolidates his power, uh, domestic authority. I'm still curious as to how he's going to translate this kind of post-liberal world order into something relatively concrete. Because I was surprised in the uh, introduction to the program that Turkey was bracketed with Russia and China. Because you know, China thinking essentially in terms of a Sino-American bipolarity, the Russians thinking of the big three. Well, what does Turkey want? Turkey, it seems to me, would want a, a a multipolar order that would have 10, 12, 15 poles. Well, I still don't, I, I still struggle to visualize how Turkey, even if it had everything go well for it in the next few years, how it would try and influence the formation of a new international order. Mm -hmm. um, Turkey doesn't really, uh, um, I mean, it's not in favor of a, like, absolutely new international law order. Right. Okay. but rather reforming the existing order, especially the UN. Okay. Um, uh, and also, um, it also uh, like yearns to be, be more independent, yeah. uh, which we have seen uh, you know, closely during the Arab Spring. And it's mm -hmm. not only Turkey, actually. We've seen Qatar emerging as an uh, influential actor in the Arab Spring. We, uh, we see Russia trying to be more influential, or China. So yeah. we see all these emerging powers uh, you know, having this desire to be more independent and more influential and to kind of not uh, be uh, confined to the rules uh, of the existing international systems, which were, uh, you know, these rules were made by the, the Western powers that, themselves. Right. So they kind of criticize this West, uh, this white uh, privilege over these institutions. So in this connection, do you see Turkey as being much closer to Russia, to China, to other authoritarian or semi-authoritarian regimes, much closer to them than it is, to say, to its NATO partners with whom it allegedly shares, shared, uh, it shares values? Mm -hmm. Well, when you look at Turkey's foreign policy, um, like, uh, you see that the main anchors of Turkey's foreign policy have always been uh, its Western alliances, its yeah. Na NATO membership, its EU accession process, uh, its alliance with the United States uh, and the Western world. And these have been the main anchors of Turkey's foreign policy um, and the main institutions. And Turkey actually, uh, like even when you look at its policy in the Middle East, uh, for example, like Turkey was, uh, maybe not now, but uh, seven, eight years ago, it was seen as a model country yeah. in the Middle East. Maybe, maybe even now, like it applies to some context, uh, with its democracy, uh, secular state, uh, and its uh, story of modernization. Yeah. Um, and this has a lot to do with its Western, uh, with its membership in Western institutions and its connections to the West, actually. Yeah. So it gives Turkey, um, you know, a kind of um, an upper hand or a kind of international, um, uh, you know, privilege uh, in these regions. Like, uh, right. it makes okay. Turkey stand out as a as a model, uh, as a bridge country between East and the West. So if Turkey loses that identity, the Western identity, yeah. I think it would be very vulnerable. Not That's only security-wise, yeah. but also, uh, you know, yeah. in terms of its identity, uh, and uh, also because of the fact that uh, almost all of its in institutions are, uh, you know, um, okay. kind of uh, Western-based. Right. Okay, great. Talking of models, Minister Chernish, is there a European model anymore? Um, are there such things as European shared European values? Uh, particularly post Crimea annexation of Crimea, uh, post annexation of Crimea, post uh, Russian invasion of Donbas, is there a European order, or ha is, ha did those events basically break the European order? For me, it's clear that it's a, okay. For me, it's clear that this is a break of European order, a universal order. 
you know, that's very important to understand for us, for Ukrainians, for example, that there are no clear answer how to get Crimea back. And every time people ask, for example, not only me, a lot of politicians within the Ukraine, how we can get Crimea back and when? And no clear answer, not only from the Ukrainian politicians. So now a lot of our friends, partners implement non-recognition policy and sanctions. As two means, we usually use them in order to persuade not the population of Crimea and not the population of Ukraine that there is a mechanism to get it back, but it's not, not very clear for the, for the people and for, for the whole Europe as well, because it's an attempt to break the whole old uh, order, world order. And this is the problem that a lot of people think still that U.S. is a status quo power. And they say, okay, if, if the U.S. is status quo power, ask them to do something with that. And other part of politicians say, don't see, or don't look at, at any poll, uh, transatlantic poll or European or other one. We have Russia with the military, very high military capabilities, and Russia is a pool. Just bandwagon in it, and that's it. And you will be successful. Don't pay attention to the fact that Russia is a authoritarian country. That's not matter. They, get, they, 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 they have oil, natural gas, and then uh, the prices uh, in Ukraine, or not only in Ukraine, we have the same approach in Georgia, in Moldova, and neighboring countries. Just bandwagoning the Russia, uh, Russian Federation. And, and then another point in the fruit of this, that Ukraine and other countries are seeking a status quo, as I said to you before, but Russia says the status quo was in 1999, not in 2014. And this is the question, let's discuss it, they say, all the time. This is not the status quo. Crimea was Russian, I mean, within even USSR, so the status quo is now. Yeah. And another point, if they have, I mean, Russia, well, of, of course they have very high level of military capabilities. And if, if, if there is a poll with approximately the same or with the equilibrium in, in military domain, they, they use non-military domain as a tool, as a means for global competitions and regional competitions. Mm -hmm. and, and we have been discussing a lot information domination, cyber domination, etc., etc., etc. And my, my question is, why is the area of competition? Yeah. Not Russia. Europe, Ukraine, Georgia, Moldova, Syria, Venezuela, but not Russia. And, and then very, that's very difficult to explain to, for example, to Europeans, in my opinion, why we just declare deterrence, diplomacy, in the same time when Russia, 3D, diplomacy, deterrence, and defense, I've heard, yeah. and Russia do delay, dis, destroy, destroy, and other Ds. So that, that's very difficult to, to, to explain. And that this is kind of mistrust of the population. Uh, and, and my last point in, in refer to yeah. this, you know, if someone has real capability to support you and does, uh, doesn't do nothing in this, mm -hmm. two ways to explain this. They don't want, or he or she, they don't want to help, yeah. or they don't have this capacity, this capability to, to support. And then some, some, sometimes you need a more clear answer. And, and in refer to Russian Federation and other superpower, global power, or global competitors, they're very important to understand that a lot of theorists say about interdependency in order to prevent conflicts. Yeah. And we had this experience with Russia. 
But that was not an interdependency itself. That was dependency, or at least asymmetrical dependency. And then that's because Russia has some energy uh, lever on, on us, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So economically, all China, Russia, Turkey use a lot of campaign in order to promote their economic interests or, or even Sometimes they, they do cooperatively or collaboratively in this, but, but it does mean that they are going to formulate a kind of constellation of, of uh, pools in order to dominate in the world. At the same time, so we see that if Russia promotes its economic, or China, its economic interest, sure. so somehow, finally, they have a big influence in political area mm. within targeted, I would say, country or even at international, uh, on the international stage. Okay. You mentioned you know, that there were two reasons for inaction. One, you don't want to, you don't want to help. And the other, you can't help because you lack the capacity. So I was wondering, and to really put you on the spot here, do you think that Western democracies who say they run their systems based on values do you think that they care about the fate of Ukraine? Do you think they really truly believe in a rules-based international order or that's just a bromide to cover the fact that we are increasingly moving to a interest-based and even a power-based international order? Or am I being unfair? Are you prepared to be more charitable about their motivations? You think they're perhaps maybe confused? They're still working it out? You know, I I think that the, the nature of democracy allows all of us, I mean, sure. developed democracies or developing democracies yeah, yeah, yeah. To, to operate effectively. In my opinion, not all politicians understand the level of threats and how to respond, well, how to res uh, respond on, on the uh, threats as a kind of effective and efficient measures yeah. should, uh, that should be taken in order to be effective. For example, w we rely mostly on international organizations, partners, bilateral or mul multilateral conversation, negotiation, etc., etc. That's a kind of, in my opinion, traditional style of, uh, of tackling the problem after big consensus. And at the same time, autocrats uh, operate very actively and forced. And in my opinion, if the system of, of dealing with the problem within democracy will be changed, for example, task forces to deal with that, with their uh, with a kind of empowered before by, by the countries, uh, Western countries, for example, democratic countries. Yeah. It could change the, 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 the way how we tackle the problem. And, and then that's, that's the real, uh, real uh, understanding from, from our point of view, that if you want to change something, you have to act within, demo, within democratic legislative framework, yeah. at the same time to create a new approach, a modern one, to, to, to move quickly to their sport in, uh, and, and uh, be effective and demonstrate that even within democracy, you can yeah. operate very effectively. Yeah. This is not, we are talking about values. Sure. Sure. So the system is one of them. And then, for example, Russia and Russian politicians uh, already say that, look at them. They even don't decide I mean, I, I don't know, the banding of banana. Sure. They say all the time this. And, and we say, we can do it all together. We know how to do that. And this is our example, how we tackle this in non-military domain, including. Sure. Now, <clears throat> I wanted to ask you about Ukraine's European direction. There's a lot of talk about sort of- The majority. Ukraine having 
uh, close relations with the EU. Um, there's much greater popularity of NATO within Ukraine today than there was even just a few years ago that Russia has actually done um, uh, NATO and Ukraine a favor in that regard. Um, but I, it, all this makes me wonder about what are European values? Because we talk again about NATO and the EU being values-based institutions. But what does that mean in practice? I was recently at the Lenin Mary conference, and Hungary's EU minister was there. And he said, we in Hungary believe in democratic values. However, we do not believe in liberal values. So I was confused, because I'd always assumed that kind of we live in liberal democracy, so we have liberal democratic values. So what kind of values does Ukraine imagine Europe to have? What kind of values will Ukraine have when it's even more integrated inside Europe? How do you visualize that? The, 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 the first thing that the majority of the population, Ukrainian population, support the so-called European values. We call them European values, but at the same time, a lot of them are universal values. Yeah. And we, we, we have been trying to build a democracy, develop, de de develop democracy, uh, and, and of course we have a dialogue with Council of Europe, with EU, with some prominent members of two organizations, and with NATO, of course, yeah. in order to strategize our approach in every area, in every domain. And then one of them to build, of course, the system yeah. that everyone, everyone from your society should be protected by, by law and should be respected. At the same time, the interest of every member of our society should be respected. This is the, the most important value. And then all, all other uh, objections or uh, tasks, purposes, etc., etc., within our country should be reached in consultation with our partners, we believe that they could help us to organize the system in a way that very close to European, uh, most European countries. And then this is a permanent dialogue with our partners yeah. because you, you know that, that we have made a lot of mistakes yeah. in order to solve <laughs> some of our problem. We need some, some advices from France, but from France only. Okay. Because sometimes you, All right. we have some, some advices from Russian Federation. Okay. Right. I'm going to open the discussion out to uh, the audience. Um, just a couple of rules. Um, could you please uh, give your name and affiliation? And also, please, no multi-part questions or interventions. Thanks. Um, who would like to uh, get going from the audience? No? No? Yes? Okay. Thank you. Uh, I'm Guillaume Legan from the uh, French Ministry of Defense. And I, I would like to, to um, I'd be interested to have the insight of, uh, uh, of the panel on uh, the influence of uh, each of these great powers uh, in the Balkans. How do they see it? Is it uh, growing? Is it declining? Uh, the three of them. Okay, great. Um, next, that's it. Uh, so in the second row there. In the second row, second row, just. Esat Aslani, in Severna Macedonia. Pitanje za tursku osobu. Do kad Turcija će da prizna svi nacionaliteti što žive u Turskoj? Zada bi Turska... ...da kaže da ima demokraciju u Turskoj. Hello. 
sorry, what was the question? What was the question? Yes, yes, I okay. uh, I hope very soon. <laughs> could, maybe you could just repeat the question. Um, just, just. The, the question was when will Turkey recognize all the, en en all the ethnicities living in Turkey? Right, okay. So I say I hope very soon. Um, the first question was on uh, the impact of great powers in the Balkans. Um, so, Teresa, how do, you, how do you see the impact of Russia, China, actually the United States as well, and um, also regional powers as well? Thanks. Okay. Um, I was thinking about Commissioner Han. He, his quote, uh, the EU Commissioner Han said, um, that the European Union had overestimated Russia and underestimated China. And it's like three years too late, but at least they recognize that they have a problem there. And in, in a lot of respects, Russia has been almost a useful idiot. It's been distracting um, everyone from what's really going on. And China is very clever. And you know, their investments, you know, people need the money. But if you really look at how much money the EU has invested in that region, it's far more than China, but everyone thinks China has such influence and impact there. So I think the EU really needs to up their game and you know, hire the people who do Huawei ads in, in Brussels, who you know, say vote for 5G, vote for values. But I think that the EU really needs to up their game. They're putting a lot of money in there and they're not even getting credit. And if they do a, a joint project with the Chinese where the EU paid like 95%, the Chinese get all the, um, the publicity about building this bridge. So, um, Teresa, is that China's fault though? That's no, no, I'm saying the EU yeah. needs to I mean, up their because game. And uh, I would also add that since it's finally on Europe's radar, I mean, Mer uh, Chancellor Angela Merkel has commented about this. And then every September 1st, all the EU ambassadors come back to Brussels. And this was one of the top three issues. So the EU is paying attention. What they can do uh, remains to be seen. And I'll leave the other panelists to comment about the other countries. Cool. Yeah, I would say that um, one of China's uh, great initiatives is the Belt and Road Initiative to try to create infrastructure um, throughout Eurasia and up to and through um, through Europe. And um, clearly, the Balkans um, are part of um, China's plans for this BRI and trying to uh, unite China and Europe uh, with greater infrastructure. Um, in terms of the United States, I think that the US interest is to incorporate the Balkans more strongly into Europe, um, both economically and politically as a way that would um, ultimately be to the benefit of the population of the Balkans. Paul, can I push you a bit more, since you raised the Belt and Road Initiative. Um, wh when you read wes Western commentary and, and media on the Belt and Road Initiative, they make it, and also Western policymakers, they make it sound like this is a grand strategic initiative, almost certainly to take over Eurasia and maybe even beyond. But sometimes I, I, when I look at, you know, talk to Chinese about this, I get the sense that it's a very sort of ragged set of initiatives, that much of Chinese policy making, far from being the sort of the, you know, the hundred year, thousand year visionary stuff that, you know, that you see in, that, that talked about in the Western media, is actually ad hoc, reactive, opportunistic, that the Chinese screw up at least as much as we do. And yet, you know, so I just wonder whether the Belt and Road Initiative is really exemplifies that. Because a lot of, a lot of the Belt and Road it is about sticking a label on pre-existing initiatives, really. It, it's just like if you want to get money from a central government, you call it a Belt and Road Initiative. So I was wondering what you thought about that and how you see the Belt and Road there's now. There's clearly um, important elements of truth in that. Uh, Belt and Road was proposed by President Xi Jinping, and with his role in China's political system, it's not going to go away. And some Chinese scholars are concerned about Belt and Road in that because of its um, prioritization among the government, you can take any kind of project you want 
label it Belt and Road and then um, get government support or perhaps government financing for that type of project. I think you're right that there's no one grand strategic plan that um, all fits into this Belt and Road. I think that um, the concerns from the West have to do with a few things. One is transparency. Yeah. Okay, how are um, contracts handed out? Um, do, do Belt and Road projects contribute to uh, corruption in, in countries where um, this infrastructure and other projects go through? Another is standards. Um, mm -hmm. Different countries want to be able to set the standards for infrastructure. Um, I mean, the old fashioned example would be railroad gates, right? Um, those standards have already been set, but uh, standards for electronic communication, all kinds of things, and will those standards be set in a fair manner? And then um, debt diplomacy is another concern of the West, that countries will go deeply into debt, taking on these Belt and Road projects. Um, and, and that's a little Do you think the Chinese diversity. are trying to get them, these countries into debt, or do you think that that's a sort yeah. of an unintended consequence? I, I don't know. Um, to me, that's probably not a, a great form of diplomacy, and um, you know, certainly other countries have not tried that as a way to gain yeah. influence. So um, I think China pushes for its best deal with countries, and sometimes leaders don't always take the national interest fully into account as sure. if they benefit from certain yeah. things. So I think um, that diplomacy cer certainly has occurred in various places. I don't know if that's a uh, specific national government a priority or goal or not. Okay. Pina, I wanted to come to you. The t uh, Turkey's impact in the Balkans. In the? the Turkey's impact uh, in Balkan politics and in the Balkan map. Okay. Um, sorry. After all, it was once the imperial power. So <laughs> yes. a, the, the Balkans, uh, well, it was the heartland of the Ottoman Empire, actually. Uh, both. Uh, we could say uh, geographically, but also intellectually. And it was the gate uh, opening to the rest of Europe. And it still is the gate opening to the rest of Europe. If you, when you look at Turkey's Balkan policy, uh, like in the last 10, 15 years, I see it as one of the most stable uh, foreign policies of Turkey. You see Turkey's policy in the Middle East has been fluctuating like, you know, on a daily basis or its policy, uh, you know, uh, towards, the, uh, towards Europe or other uh, regions of the world. But in the Balkans, Turkey has a rather stable policy, which actually uh, reminds me of Turkey's Africa policy. It has also been quite stable in recent years, yeah. you know, in, in the last 10 years. Uh, and uh, Turkey's Balkan policy focuses on uh, social relations, yeah. Uh, political relations, uh, economic relations, trade, investment, and so on, and aid. Mm -hmm. uh, and these are basically the main pillars of Turkey's uh, relations uh, with the yep. Balkans and its policy in the Balkans. It's uh, one of its most stable policies, uh, and uh, the main tenets of this policy hasn't really changed. Uh, and how influential is Turkey in the Balkans? If you look at before the Arab Spring, uh, you can see that it was like uh, one of the most important pillars of Turkey's foreign policy, mm -hmm. especially like if you look at, uh, I'm giving the example of aid because it's one of my uh, expertises. If you look at Turkey's uh, official de uh, development aid uh, statistics before the Arab Spring, you, can, you could see that the Balkans was its priority, uh, the biggest recipient of Turkey's uh, aid. Uh, but when you look at it now, it is the Middle East and it's Syria. Right. Because it became Turkey's biggest priority, basically. Okay. But this Balkan policy is still stable. Okay. Uh, I don't see a major deviation or uh, difference if you compare it with 10 years ago, basically. Okay, great. Before I come to you, Minister Chernish, I just wanted to come back to a point that you raised just now. Uh, the EU needing to sell itself better. Um, why? Why doesn't it? Why, why isn't it able to make the case? So, for example, in Ukraine, it is by far the largest investor ahead of China, and yet the, all the talk is about Chinese investment in Ukraine rather than EU investment. Why do you think that is? I think that's above my pay grade because the people who get to make these decisions are so highly paid. I don't really know why they're so tone deaf. I saw some figures for Euronews that 
you know, when you flip the channel, that's how much it gets registered. It's hardly watched in Europe. And this is, you know, the, the way they need to promote themselves is very, um, they're not very good at it. And I, I know in the earlier days when the new accession states are no longer new, um, but they wanted to kind of promote Europe. And there was a real pushback uh, in Central and Eastern Europe because they felt it was propaganda. So the, back in Brussels, they didn't push these issues because it was perceived by the new members, what was then considered new member states, as propaganda. So they actually fell into this habit of not really promoting themselves. So it's kind of a catch-22, mm -hmm. and I think it's really coming back to bite them. Um, I was shown some, I was at Leonard Mary as well, and I was shown these incredible figures that if you go to the EU website, you can see how much money they've invested in that region, and it, it, it's, you know, magnitude of order so much greater than China, but China is what is getting everyone's attention. And if I was a Chinese strategist, I think that's, that's brilliant, because wherever they go, everyone's like, look, look what China's doing. So it's giving them a lot of positive things, and then there's definitely need. There's a desire for investment, and um, EU investments have strings attached. China doesn't, so in that respect, China is attractive, but the Belt and Road Initiative also is an exporter of corruption. Sure. So we have to really be, be wary of that. And even the Chinese have come up with this saying about the silk that covers the silkworm <laughs> eventually encases it and it cannot escape. Uh, interesting. That's <laughs> very good. Um, Minister, how does Ukraine see the growth of Chinese economic influence in the country. Do you see the Chinese as in some way a threat uh, or that y Ukrainian engagement with China has certain minuses, certain uh, pitfalls that you need to be careful about? How, what's your view on that? It's very difficult being in the government to, to talk sure. about another government. But I, give, I will give you one example. Uh, we have a manufacturer in Zaporizhia, Matrosich. It's a very famous manufacturer of uh, jet engines. And one year and a half ago, or approximately, I don't remember exactly, one Russian company, through affiliated companies as well, bought their controlling stake of, of that uh, engine uh, producer, engine manufacturer. And then we saw a lot of criticism in U.S. media because it's very sensitive for, for, for China military strength in terms of for building new types of engine for aircraft. And SBU, I mean, Ukrainian Secret Service, arrested uh, all, 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 all that stake in order to prevent for some negative development, and then there is an investigation and checks, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So China is very active, and it, it is continuing in the shadow. I mean, economically, in the shadow of Russian malicious activities across the country. And for example, another, uh, uh, for example, Chinese companies, one of them at least, bought a small. Uh, cell phone uh, carrier in Ukraine. In the eastern part, they built 150 stations for their network. They, they are interested in, in getting control in, in agriculture sector of the country. And you know that they, they combine different type of behavior, economic first, and very important to understand uh, they combine two different tactics in my opinion unlike russia russia say we are super power we are great power please or not please respect us but china combine two approaches that one keep your profile low and hide your capabilities yeah. sometimes they say respect our capabilities russia always say we have a great power, we are respect our capabilities, especially the military one. But do you think as Chinese economic influence grows, they'll start to be... Yeah, no um, doubts, uh, no doubts. But as, it, as Chinese in economic influence grows, do you think the Chinese will become less polite, that they will become more open, 
in terms of their broader strategic ambitions? Do you think they're just basically smarter than the Russians? No, no, uh, no evidence of that. No evidence of that in Ukraine for the time being. But let me let me give you another example very very briefly. Before the occupation of Crimea, one Chinese company decided to build a seaport in Yuan as a part of their infrastructure to promote Silk Road strategy, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And let me remind you that the same tycoon, if I am not wrong, tried to build an alternative to Panama Canal in Nicaragua. So they pay attention to the fact that they think globally. They have their military base in Djibouti, very close to Suez Canal, etc., etc. So they think globally, and they keep their profile low sometimes. Oh, um. You made this comment um, about is China going to get tougher as their economic influence grows? Well, we know, for example, the Europeans see Donald Trump as kind of their, their nightmare um, president. He's kind of the ugliest American they can imagine. But they were kind of happy to free ride on what they perceived as sharp elbowing and trying to get the Chinese to follow the WTO rules. And they were really thinking, well, we can just free ride on this. We can stay quiet, sit on the fence, and we'll benefit. Yeah. But what we've learned now is that Donald Trump is kind of making it just between the US and China. So the Europeans are getting very nervous about that. Mm -hmm. And now we saw with the recent UCHAM, European Chamber of Commerce report, yeah. Yeah. there is an increase of demand from the Chinese on IP transfer intellectual property transfer. So the Europeans are getting even more pressed by the Chinese because they're perceived as weak and not asking. That's so they're letting Trump do the asking and so the, the Europeans are being squeezed. So it's, it's a very uncomfortable position for them to be in. And I was really shocked on Tuesday, I was at a conference in Brussels and uh, the Chinese professor who is what we call the barbarian handler, he's always sent to Europe to you know, g give us a message from Beijing. And he was telling us that, you know, no, no, we don't see Russia as a great power. And I was really surprised because I always think that um, the Chinese, when, you know, Putin comes, they roll out the red carpet, they give him a gold French necklace, they make, you know, pancakes together. They always try to make him feel good and important. Mm -hmm. But he was saying, you know, that we don't think of Russia at all as a great power. So I think that yeah. um, this will cause problems over the longer run. Yeah, great. Um, the gentleman in the third row there, just there, and then I've got you there. Thank you. Uh, Sabri Kishmori, Executive Director of the Kosovo Institute for Foreign Policy. I would like to describe just uh, shortly the role of Russia in the, in the Southeastern Europe. I don't like to say Balkans. We are Europeans. Uh, I mean, uh, it's a negative meaning the, the name Balkans, you know, but that's not a geographical notion. Sure. Uh, so your point. Uh, Russia, um, Russia has um, every three months military exercises with Serbia together with, uh, with Belarus. They, their military presence is in our region through mm -hmm. Serbia. Mm -hmm. They have a uh, center, a humanitarian center in Niche, you know. Uh, their role of this center is uh, really not uh, very humanitarian. We know that uh, they were active in a putsch here in Montenegro and two days ago in Kosovo, in the north of Kosovo, two, two Russian uh, people were involved in a, in a barricade in the north of Kosovo. I think uh, the, ball, the, the people from the southeastern Europe uh, um, have to manage this role of Russia. And I'm surprised from some uh, European Union countries, I think they don't feel that. Can I push you, what do you mean manage the role of Russia? To, uh, to do more pressure against uh, uh, one of the biggest friends of Russia in the southeastern Europe, to Serbia, to decide between two ways. They have to decide. Then, then all of this destabilizing factor is managed from the territory of Serbia, you know, from the center. And they have to do more pressure to decide in the way of the European Union, of Europe, or in the way of Russia. They, they try to have two ways. And I think that's, an, that's maybe an, a, a, 
a job that the European Union and US has to do. But from an outside, yes, because from an outsider's perspective, it's, it's difficult to see how you pressure one of the strongest um, uh, states in southeastern Europe to do something it may not want to do. So what does pressure mean? Does pressure mean, I don't know, sanctions, or trade restrictions? What, what, how, what practical measures do you envisage? Um, I think uh, they are, they are um, for example, Serbia is not in a dialogue with the European Union to uh, have the membership by the European Union. Okay. And in, in the European Union, they are political values they have to respect it. And uh, one of these values is not to have a close relationship with a country which is very aggressive against Ukraine, okay. very aggressive against Georgia, okay. Transnistria, Abhazia, South Ossetia. That means is a, is a right. country that is a problem. And if you have such a close relationship with such a country, you have a problem with the values of European Union or the Western values. That's, point, that's uh, point my Turkish. position. Um, gentlemen, a uh, few rows back, uh, uh, Deputy Head of Mission, Turkish Embassy. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I'm sorry, may I sit? <laughs> Uh, my name is Bleda Kajar, as you mentioned. Uh, okay. Um, well, uh, one opinion and one question. Uh, uh, just one. <laughs> Please. Uh, okay. I mean, I will uh, somehow then uh, uh, can make you them speak together. A bit louder? I will make them together then, okay? okay. I okay. will uh, like right. this. All right. So, um, it is, I mean, uh, mentioned that uh, concerning the influence of Turkey in the Balkans, mm -hmm. I mean. Uh, so, we are in Montenegro, let's speak about Montenegro. What does Turkey want for Montenegro? We always supported NATO membership. Uh, we support uh, EU full membership, uh, European Council, all the Western, I mean, institutions. Mm -hmm. uh, and whenever there is a need for help, we try to assist with TICA and so on. I mean, if this is, means influence, okay, I mean, we are influential. I don't, I don't think that it's something bad what we are doing. <laughs> uh, and uh, lastly, just for the gentleman I'm asking, I mean, uh, this is a sincere question. Uh, is there any ethnicity not recognized in Turkey? Any. And if there is an answer for this, I would like to again speak about it. Okay, thank you very much. Um, we have um, 10 minutes left. I want to just go to our panelists, unless there are any more contributions from the floor. A uh, uh, lady there. Thank you very much. I'm Yulia Smolovska, uh, Director General, Art of Business and Diplomacy Group from Ukraine. I want to dwell on the question that you posed to the Minister of Ukraine with regard to whether the Western uh, um, partners have uh, the capacity or they don't have the will to assist Ukraine. Well, I'm not, I'm in no doubt that you do have a will, but whether you, you probably then uh, always estimated your capacity to help or, and the, uh, the question, uh, the other question would be, is there a plan B, what to do next? Because so far, we don't see any sort of developments to a constructive resolution of a deadlock that we are facing right now. Thank you. No, that's excellent. Um, that actually leads quite nicely to my last question. I wondered whether you could each speak for two minutes on this. If you had to identify one policy response that you think would be effective in your dealings with authoritarian regimes such as China, such as Russia, others, that, that might make a difference, that might make a difference, not just in terms of maybe constraining some of the worst excesses of their behavior, but also would do something to, if you like, invest more substance in the very idea of a rules-based international order. So a concrete policy proposal is what I'm looking from each of you. Start with you, Teresa. Okay, you gave me no time to think about that, but I have one. Um, under the Juncker Commission, he had proposed at the beginning of it that there would be a transparency initiative. 
and that never got through. Why? Because lobbyists don't want that. So I think one of the key issues, especially with the authoritarian advance, is to find out who's paying for these opinions of think tanks, leaders, who's lobbying who. And I would suggest that the next commission really get serious and have a transparency initiative created so we can see people's books. Every think tank should have their uh, books online. And I think that that way we at least understand where these opinions are coming from. Very good. Um, actually, just while I, I was going to come to you last, Minister, but I know you've done a lot of work on um, monitoring money laundering operations. And one of the criticisms of Western countries, and this comes back to the sort of the will to do something, take the United Kingdom, that sort of paragon of a rules-based international system, and yet London is seen by many people as the money laundering capital of the world, not just of Russian capital, but Chinese capital. What's your view on this? First of all, money is a key issue. Follow the money, and, and finally you, you detect the, the activities that they are going to your organize and to your, to your do that, that that that's the problem for for us money laundering is a kind of so-called uh, scheme all the time money goes back to its owner yeah. but terrorism like financing it's very similar like Russia operates to finance their, their influential operations yeah. it's very it's it's very important to understand that no connection between the owner of the money sometimes yeah. And those groups or individuals who implement or execute influential campaigns through social media, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And one case, for example, in the states, and uh, after investigation, the connection uh, was uh, detected, and then the investigation was successful. But but if they use a lot of uh, intermediaries uh, with no connection with each other. Finally, it's very similar to terrorist financing, in my opinion. And, uh, and this is the, the, the resource that allows to operate within liberal economies, within liberal societies, without any detection from, from authorities, because they usually try to track uh, crimes, not influential campaigns. So picking up the question, that last question, you know, what, what is one concrete step that Western governments could do about this problem, which of course is a really deep-rooted problem. It won't be solved overnight. Uh, but what might be at least a, 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 represent some progress? In my opinion, we, we should uh, continue to build up our military capacity, not to get the first thing. Military capacity first, in order to have at least very, well, not equilibrium, but, but very, very good military capacity to prevent Russia from using against us the military might. But at the same time, politically and diplomatically, we should have a solidarity to implement, as we believe, sanctions in more efficient manner in order to put pressure on Russia to solve the problem, not by military means, Sure. but through negotiations. Okay. So that is not the, the, the kind of primary goal to build up our military capacity to get by military means those territories back. This is just to prevent them from entering uh, in the rest of Ukraine, gotcha. that's it. Okay. Pina, what do you think might represent a cogent, coherent, concrete response to the challenge of authoritarianism in in the Middle East. I, I, the reason I also ask this question is, again, we talk about a rules-based international system, but yet Saudi Arabia is the United, along with it, Israel, but Saudi Arabia is one of the United States' chief allies in the region, and yet it is the very antithesis of a liberal democracy working in a rules-based international system. So practically, what can we do about it? Thank you very much. Um, actually, uh, I think there can be a technical answer to this question, yeah. but there can also be a philosophical answer to this question. Please. My technical answer would be, I think the biggest weapon against authoritarianism is the free, free flow of information through the media or the new media 
yeah. you know, uh, like the internet, the use of internet, the use of uh, digital technology and stuff. Somehow have an international regime to regulate it. But my philosophical answer to that would be, uh, what do we mean when we say authoritarianism? Are we talking about open authoritarianism? What about subtle forms of authoritarianism sure. that are Fair present uh, in the West itself? You said it yourself, one of the biggest allies of the United States, Saudi Arabia. Why is Saudi Arabia uh, a close ally of the United States, such an authoritarian regime? Hmm. On one hand, uh, the United States uh, you know, criticized Saddam Hussein entered, the, entered Iraq, devastated it, devastated the Middle East for years, and now it's uh, close friends with Saudi Arabia. Mm -hmm. So what is the West doing against authoritarianism? What about the subtle forms of uh, authoritarianism that are evident in the West? What about uh, wh the uh, white privilege that is uh, present in the world? We talked about, um, in the morning session, we talked about security mm -hmm. in the EU you know, whether to establish an army for the uh, EU or not. What do we mean by security? Are we talking about the security of institutions or the security of people? What is this army going to fight? Who is it going to fight? Is it going to fight against Russia or is it going to fight against the refugees? Yeah. Is it going to uh, work to stop the refugees from entering the EU? Yeah. Why do doesn't the EU solve the problems uh, at their core why doesn't it prevent the people to uh, look for uh, you know, new lands, uh, solutions to their problems, rather than staying in their homelands and uh, have a, a you know, decent life? What is the EU doing to provide them with this decent life? No, it's, those so are excellent. All these norms and values, like these Western norms and values, uh, are they really universal? Or are they really applicable in the, you know, in the other parts of the world? Or are they re really there just to use as an excuse to exert uh, Western influence in the world or exert Western interest in the rest of the world? Well, certainly, whatever, wh whatever you think about it, it's clear that that is precisely the question that many people in China and Russia and other non-Western countries are asking, really. They suspect the West essentially of using liberal norms, democratic norms and values as a cover for the naked pursuit of self-interest. And, and that's one of the problems. It comes back to a point that um, Therese is raising, really, that you know, you, the EU needs to sell itself. But the West, I think, needs to sell itself better. Um, Paul, um, you have the last word. How does... How do, we, how do we revive the liberal-based international order? How, what, what, what might represent a concrete step? So rather than just talk, talking piously about rules and norms and democratic institutions and representation and transparency and accountability, concretely, what should we do? Well, this is a tall order for the last comment for the day. It I'm is, not but... I'm quite sure I can, <laughs> uh, I can uh, address this to your satisfaction, but... Um, I think that success domestically um, for the liberal West is an important, um, important for restoring the liberal international order in some ways. Yeah. Um, when the internet first came about, people quickly talked about the fact that this is going to spell the end to authoritarianism because there's so much information that's going to be out there. And in fact, the opposite has happened in some way. Authoritarian states have learned to use information in ways that can um, further their cause and, and control the information Absolutely. that yeah. um, is perhaps dangerous to them. Um, and so China, for instance, has done a pretty good job of trying to control uh, the information that's given about it. Um, I mean, recently, even uh, the CBS television station in the United States um, censored a piece that it thought would bring about certain anger to China. And so I think um, yeah. upholding our own values in our societies is, is important for this. Yeah. And I think about um, one of the issues with the whole global order now is that more and more groups are getting involved. In some ways, it's being democratized. Um, we had 
at the, the foundation of the United Nations, we had five permanent members um, that controlled most of the territory in the world at yeah. the time. Yeah. Um, that has totally changed. And so the, the order is facing these challenges in part because of political changes at the domestic level as well as technological changes. Uh, the information revolution not only is vastly reshaping domestic politics, but also um, the international order. And so um, I think we need to give ourselves uh, a little bit of sympathy in that the order is trying to deal with these huge changes. And so what liberal societies need to do is show that they are able to incorporate minorities without putting them in camps or um, succeed with the diversity that we have in ways um, in which are successful and success sells. Yeah. I think that's an excellent answer to, I think, what's been a, an excellent conclusion to what's been a most fascinating, at least for me, stimulating uh, discussion. Um, clearly, ladies and gentlemen, we're at the uh, very beginning of what's going to be a a long, long conversation and debate. Um, but in the meantime, I hope you will join me in thanking our wonderful panelists, Teresa Fallon, Paul Bolt, uh, Pinar Akpinar, and um, uh, uh, Minister, uh, 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 thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs>